Right. So um, the first thing um, I want to say is welcome. Uh, welcome to the Orthodox Fellowship of St. John the Baptist Summer Series, um, our virtual visits to monasteries. The fellowship brings together members of several Orthodox church traditions in the British Isles and Ireland. And we come together within the fellowship and through prayer, discussion and mutual friendship to deepen our commitment to and our understanding of the Orthodox Christian faith. With this in mind, we organize national and international conferences, pilgrimages, study weekends and youth festivals. As the effects of coronavirus have reduced the possibility for travel, we wanted to offer something for the faithful which would spark interest in holy places, places where spirituality is at their heart. We'll be visiting different monasteries each week on Zoom in different countries. Ukraine today, Greece, Romania, Russia, the USA and Lebanon, all virtually. God willing, some of us will be able to visit these monasteries in the future, um, having been inspired by the presentations. I'm going, I've put in the group chat, just to let you know, a policy for this event. Um, it's really just a, 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 to cover us um, about any bad behavior. So if you're, if you're bad during these presentations, I will uh, uh, either ask you to leave the conversation or as a last resort, we would stop it. But I, I don't expect that to happen. I expect um, you'll all be very well behaved. What we have is a chat function in Zoom. So for those of you who aren't familiar, um, that will be um, a little box which looks like a speech bubble somewhere on your screen. It will be different whether, uh, depending whether you've connected using a laptop or a computer or your phone. But there, somewhere on your screen there'll be a chat function. On there, that is the place where you can place your questions for Father Tikon. And I will keep an eye on those and look at those at the end of the session. Um, so you can post them during the presentation if they occur to you and so you won't forget them. Just to let you know, we're going to make a donation um, to uh, the monasteries that we feature during this series. And if you would like to make a donation on top of that for us to pay on your behalf, um, I will put the link in the chat and you can use that to um, make a donation and that will be split equally between the monasteries that we feature. So here's to the first session. In this first visit, we're traveling to Ukraine to the Monastery of Holy Domitian, St. Nicol Nicholas St. Basil, near Donetsk, and Father Tikhon will be our guide. He was born in St. Petersburg in Russia, but was raised in Donetsk in the Ukraine. He's been a member of the community in Nikolskoye since 2002, and personally knew the founder of the monastery, Father Sosima, for eight years before that. He recently completed his DPhil in Oxford in 2019, just last year. As I've mentioned, after Father Tikon has concluded his presentation, there will be the opportunity for questions. So type them into the chat and we will address as many as we can at the end. So I will share my screen. And we will start the presentation. Now you should be, when I've shared my screen, you should be able to see a small image of Father Tikon at the side. If that's in the way of the presentation, then please just move the image um, so that you can see the presentation. Okay. Father Tigon, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I would like to thank the Fellowship of St. John the Baptist for the invitation and for this amazing opportunity to speak about our monastery and our elder to such a wide audience, I believe spread all over the world. So thank you. Um, perhaps could you move to the first slide? So the Holy Domitian St. Um, Nicholas and St. Basil Monastery is situated in a rural area of the Donetsk region in southeastern Ukraine. The monastery is located on the site of the former parish of St. Basil, 
in a village. There has never been any monastery before on that site. And most of the buildings were built between uh, 1997 and 2003. And the impressive cathedral of the Holy Domitian of the Mother of God, which uh, you can see in the um, center of this uh, picture, um, also was, be, uh, was built in this time and was blessed by Petra Kirill in 2009. So it's a new monastery, which grew near its founder and uh, elder, Father the Sima. I'm sure most of you have heard uh, of the military conflict in Eastern Ukraine. And the monastery hasn't been affected by the conflict directly, but it was cut from the diocesan center, which is in Donetsk, and obviously it has been um, affected in many um, other indirect ways by the conflict, by this um, very sad situation. The monastery also has lost many of its benefactors who um, um, donated the money for these beautiful buildings. So, uh, because the region was devastated by all these developments. But we continue our life of prayer and charity. So, please could you move further. And our monastic community consists of three parts. So, there are three parts to um, uh, the community, the monastery, the men's monastery, the convent, the sisters, and the almshouse, the house of mercy, which um, for elderly and disabled people. So each of those three mentioned divisions um, has its own head. However, the um, head of the house of mercy and the mother superior or the abbess of the nunnery are in obedience, as it were, to the father superior of the men's monastery. And you can see um, this picture uh, in this slide. Um, well, not all of the members of the community, I believe, not all of them, but uh, many, yeah, from both uh, the fathers and on the right and the sisters and some elderly nuns who um, live in the House of Mercy. Um, and currently at the moment, our Father Superior, Father Ambrosius, well, well, last year he was consecrated as a bishop. So he's now a bishop, Ambrosius, the head of the monastery of the community. Uh, the convent and the monastery follow synabitic monastic rules. So it's those of you who are familiar with the life um, of the um, community um, of Father Safroni in Essex and in Tolos and Knights. So it, our monastery, although it's actually mm, quite mm, bigger, I would say much bigger, <laughs> at least um, in terms of numbers, in numbers, um, but um, it's pretty similar. So we have a common refectory, and may, but different buildings for the sisters and for the fathers. So that's pretty much a um, similar um, way of um, life. Um, more than 250 permanent inhabitants live in our community. Uh, I mean, in those uh, mentioned three parts of both um, in the, um, the fathers, like about 70 fathers probably, and the um, sisters, younger sisters, and the elderly sisters and some fathers who live in this um, uh, house of mercy. And some of our relatives, or our parents perhaps, some of the, or those old priests who were sent by the metropolitan, some of them also um, would inhabit the uh, house of mercy. So this is a care home, an orthodox monastic care home. So now you have the general idea about our monastery. The next point I'm going to tell you about is a person is, who was the founder of this big monastic community. 
And his name was Eskima Akimandite the Seaman. Yes, thank you. And uh, all of us who live in the monastery these days do believe that he was a holy man, a real saint of our days. And let's begin with the end of his life. You can find a small chapel in the center of the monastery. And this is the place of repose of our Father Zasima. So in this picture, you can see the interior of Father Zasima's chapel, as we call it. Um, you know, the Father's chapel. You can see very beautiful wall paintings and a lot of flowers from his spiritual ch children um, or as a sign of their love. There is always such a fragrance there, like in the paradise. <laughs> mm. I can go further. Yes, this is Father the Sima. His civil name was Ioan uh, John uh, Sokur. Mm. He didn't leave us his teachings in writing, as for example, Father Safroni did to some other elders. And also he died when he was only 58. And he had been very ill for many, many years, basically all his life. By the end of his life, his sufferings were enormous. His doctors said that he suffered for 10 people. And yet with all this, he served and helped others. His feet were bleeding with sores. And yet he still stood and served. From 1995, his, the sores in his feet reached the bones and he had an almost permanent temperature of 39 very often. Yet he spent his nights in prayer, hardly sleeping. Let us thank the Lord for every good thing and every bad thing in our life, he said. Let's please go further. Next. Mm -hmm. In 1986, Father Zasima was appointed as priest in charge of St. Basil's Church in the village of Nikolska, uh, future, uh, where a future monastery was built in Volnavaha district in the Donetsk region. And uh, owing to his impressive efforts, the church was renovated and in 1988, the priest house uh, with the space for baptisms and pilgrim apartments, as well as the refectory were built. So um, as you can see in this slide on the left, um, it's um, the St. Basil's church, uh, which was built before the revolution in, uh, by uh, those peasants who lived in that village in 1912, just before um, the, the Great War. And Father Zasima, when Father Zasima was appointed in charge of the church, he found it in this uh, state, as you can see in this uh, left picture. And uh, on the right picture, it's how it looks now and basically how it um, started looking very, very soon in just in two years after the Father Sima was there. So he um, made this huge effort and the whole community, of course, not just he himself, but he inspired everybody to, to build and to decorate the church, to redecorate and to do everything. And so several new buildings were built around the church and still, but still, it was a parish. Um, please switch to next. Mm -hmm. So this picture comes from 1997. So it was made in 1990. It still was a parish, still. But this year marks the beginning of the um, construction of the monastery. And you can spot probably a couple of nuns in the, in the, in the crowd. <laughs> so there were already some, some, some of the uh, his spiritual were tortured. So in, after some time, after some time, a number of people who wanted to serve God under the spiritual guidance of Schema Akimandrat Zasima 
increased. In 1997, the monastery rented a lodging house from the local authorities, situated close to the church. It was refurbished by the efforts of the brothers and sisters as a hospice mercy home for taking care of weak people who were advanced in years. At first, um, there were 40 of them. And now when they, uh, in 2003, they moved to a new building. Uh, and in now this house accommodates uh, about 100 people, uh, elder and disabled people. So in, two, um, in 1998, a building for the fathers and in 1999, one for the sisters were constructed. In 2009, in 2001, the sisterhood community was given the status of a convent. So that's uh, basically the year of actual uh, founding, it's the official open. Although I must say that the actual monastic community goes back to the 70s actually. So it goes much, much further. I mean, the first, the, the core of the monastic community was formed um, at the end of the 70s uh, around Father Zasima, still in the Soviet times, of course. And they served in, and lived in, in a parish before even Father was appointed to Nikolska and some other parishes as well. So and they, they, they just moved um, together with him. So some of those sisters and some of the fathers. Yeah, but the official um, monastery was registered in 2001 and it was um, at first as a sisterhood. Um, and in 2002, a men's monastery was regist registered. So now we have actually, it's a slightly different situation compared to um, the Essex Monastery, where one official monastery exists and is um, um, laid uh, by the father of human diet and, um, and both fathers and, and sisters are members of one monastery. So um, in our case, in, in, in our monastery, we have two um, official that were different monasteries, but we live still as a one community. Um, next to each other and uh, having um, common services and common meals and and uh, but of course because the monastery is bigger numbers are much bigger than in Essex um, then <laughs> generally because the situation is different oh but but we knew and father the Sima himself, um, he revered very much um, uh, the word of Father Safroni, I must say. And he kept a letter uh, which was addressed not to him, but to some, to another elder, uh, another spiritual father in Russia. And Father Sima had a copy of this letter, which, but still, which was very um, uh, topical uh, and very important for him and he kept it he printed it out as if I made the copy and put it on the wall um, yeah so in the room where he lived Father Superior of the monastery was uh, of the newly established monastery in 2002 was Kima Archimandad Zesima who held this position until his death which fall very soon, which, uh, yeah, which happened after that. He was, ex as I mentioned, he was extremely ill for many, many years. He experienced clinical death four times, but he had never been desperate. He would say that his wheelchair was his um, lux luxury car for the heavenly kingdom and that he wouldn't have changed it for anything if there had been any opportunity. Please could you switch to next, yes. In the evening of 28th of August, 2002, his condition deteriorated through intestine paralysis and he was taken to hospital. 
you will know when I pass away, the elders say to the brethren, the clock on my prayer desk in the sanctuary will stop working. So, and on 29th of August, 2002, at 11.40 time, and the heart of the great man of prayer stopped beating. And at the same time, his clock in the sanctuary also stopped. You can see them in, in, still uh, kept in the sanctuary of St. Basil's Church. And it was our pattern feast of the Holy Domitian two days before his death, his departure. He gave his last sermon, being extremely unwell, sitting in the well chair. His last words to his parishioners and pilgrims and the brothers were, happy feast, may God's blessing be upon all of you, upon your homes, upon your families, upon your enemies, upon your labor. May God's blessing and the holy protection of the mother of God be with all of you. So please, yes. Divine services in the monastery and the services, the monastery lives in one rhythm as if it was one organism. And the prayer, uh, the holy liturgy is the heart of the monastery. And all the services from the church are broadcast via radio uh, to all the corners and buildings and the buildings of the monastery. So you can hear what is said, uh, what is sung in the church or in the cathedral or whatever, wherever the um, service, the main service um, takes um, uh, place because there are several churches obviously in the monastery. And this is, you can see here, the main cathedral of the Mother of God, of the Domitian of the Mother of God and the fathers, the superior and the fathers are sitting in the altar. It's actually the Easter, uh, the night uh, liturgy, Easter liturgy, I think, uh, precisely this picture. So the order of services is conducted on a daily basis. So every day when it is allowed by the church, typical, um, uh, we have the, the holy, we serve the holy liturgy and all other services according to the typicon of the church and according to our um, monastery typicons. Uh, there, there are some uh, special, special, how to say, specific um, um, features in the typicon of our monastery, how our father found the blessed to serve us. And um, please, could you do the next slide? Mm -hmm. And the Psalter, the Psalter is, is read around the clock uh, in the sister's building and in the House of Mercy Hospice. And those who live in the House of Mercy do the most important thing, the, the most important business. They pray for the whole world. They don't have any obediences. They, they, they can't work as the other youngest fathers and sisters do. They have some uh, obediences, we call them, uh, so some jobs in the monastery everybody has. And, but the elderly nuns and monks, they only pray, only pray. Uh, they, they read Jesus' prayer, they, they say Jesus' prayer, or they read um, uh, the Psalter and some other um, books, prayer books. And the Psalter, it's a sort of established through a sleepless Psalter, so-called, um, when they uh, read Psalms in, in turn. So one sister reads one kafisma, so several Psalms, and then commemorates names which are given to commemorate and to pray for. So after each um, um, so they commemorate the names of the living and the departed, those who ask, who need prayers, and, uh, and the whole monastery, of course, they commemorate, and um, everybody. Um, and then, after some time, after one hour, perhaps, of such prayers, uh, it's 
given to somebody else and so they continued around the clock all the day and night so that's one of the um, services one of um, of course everybody has their own um, uh, rule prayer um, prayerful rule of prayer which they play which they <clears throat> perform in, in in their cells so on this picture uh, this Skimanan Maria is reading sleepless Psalter please could we move further But Father Zasima, when he was appointed uh, uh, to um, this parish, St. Basil, in this village of Nikolska, and when he came there with his disciples, those who lived with him, his first nuns and monks, and who settled there, he wasn't the first monk, he wasn't the first monastics, as it were, to, 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 to settle and to come here. And it's interesting that after the revolution, after the revolution in time of the persecutions in the 30s, when many monasteries and nunneries were closed in different places, um, in Nikolsk, uh, uh, there were some nuns who were exiled uh, from the Crimean convents, uh, and they lived in the village of Nikolsk. There were several nuns. They religiously kept the holy tradition of Nikolskaya village and passed it on later generations. For example, and um, the appearance of the Mother of God, which occurred here before the revolution, near Nikolskaya, at this place where now the procession is moving, uh, is, go, is, is heading. Um, this procession, which is depicted in this picture. So a healing spring began to flow at that place. Uh, um, the peasants of the local villages and other inhabitants held prayer services and cross-bearing processions took place there long after the revolution, especially on the feast day of the Kursk, Kursk root icon of the Mother of God, commemorating the event when she sanctified that place, so the appearance of the Mother of God. And these um, godless, you know, god-haters, tried to destroy the Holy Spring and erase its memory from the people's minds. But the holy water appeared again and again through the concrete. And Father Dasima uh, heard um, like through that um, nuns who lived and then they passed on these stories to some others. And when Father Dasima came to the village, he uh, learned about these um, traditions uh, of Nikolska um, and he rekindled um, the tradition of the procession and every year on the ninth Friday after Easter the cross-bearing procession to the blessed uh, spring of the Kursk root icon of the Mother of God located outside the village actually it's five kilometers from the village so it takes some time to get to reach the place and Easter hymns, hymns to the Mother of God and other church chants are performed along the way so this is, and before the war, of course, before all these sad events, many, like thousands of people would come there to celebrate this feast. Um, that was, um, and still it's a big feast, especially for children. They like such a big procession. They sprinkle each other and bathe a lot in the river nearby while fathers, sisters, and adult pilgrims have a snack after their prayers. And so it's such a uh, tradition. Mm. In the winter, when we celebrate the Feast of Theophany, we make an ice hole where all people immerse themselves in spite of the cold weather and severe frost. And this is a lake which belongs to the monastery. We breed our fish there. And fish breeding is one of the labor activities of the monastery. This is a traditional monastic business in Russia. For example, nowadays the Valam monastery produces more than 100 tons fish per year. Well, we produce much, uh, <laughs> much, uh, much less, much fewer, <laughs> uh, but um, amount of fish. But still, it's 
we do this business as well we try to lay bind the monastery hmm. we can switch to the next slide perhaps mm -hmm. this is father sabati uh, the Sima and Savati, um, they actually, the um, saints of Father Zasima, because Father Zasima, our elder, the founder of the monastery, uh, he was called Savati, um, Father Savati, before he, as a monk, but then he was, um, he received a great schema with the name Zasima. So, yeah, and Zasima and, Savati, and Father Zasima, um, at some point when he just became a monk, he would he worked with um, bees in a pyre in the monastery in Odessa because uh, the Sima and Savati, they are, I think, as um, um, the saints of beekeeping, they are considered to be. Mm -hmm. So, labor in the monastery. Labor is a very important component of the monastic life. And in our, in, in, our, in our monastery, everybody does what he or she knows. If you are good at singing, you're welcome to the choir, usually. <laughs> if you are good at painting, you're welcome to the painting workshop. If you are an experienced electrician or a plumber, there is a lot of work for you in the, our monastery. And so on. The inhabitants of the monastery are also involved in farming and beekeeping and we have a farm with some cows and goats we don't have swine <laughs> um, so next slide please and the service of mercy is the main ministry of the monastery along with prayer. And it was Father Zasima who began picking up elderly, disabled, um, lonely and ruthless people to give them shelter, food, medical and daily care. In other words, to secure a decent Christian life in their old age. And uh, in the monastery, there is a bakery, a library, an outpatient and inpatient care for the inhabitants of the monastery. And you can see in this picture, uh, we have, well, some of our sisters, they are professionally trained as nurses and they, and they take care of, for actually those who live in the house of mercy. Um, and please, next slide. And also we have a number of workshops for carpentry, wood carving, gold embroidering, apparel and garment and garment manufacturing, icon painting, furniture manufacturing and shoe mending. So I, um, it's impossible to, you know, to, uh, to show you all the pictures. Well, I don't want to, I, I didn't want to overload you. Um, but later I will give you a link where you can see much more pictures of our monastery if you like if, and if you want, if you're inspired. Um, so maybe the hardest work in the monastery is the work in the kitchen. And we have three big kitchens, the pilgrims refectory. So we, we, we can't, um, it's impossible for, well, at first when the monastery was established, and um, when Father Sima was still alive, um, well, you know, that was a bit different time. And we had a refactor, one refactory for both, where, you know, both, uh, and the numbers were much smaller, actually, of the fathers and sisters who lived there. So um, that was one refactory for everybody. You know, these days we have uh, separate uh, refactories um, for, for the fathers, uh, and sisters and um, sometimes we invite some guests there as well uh, but um, generally for pilgrims there is a separate refectory and also the house of mercy for this um, care home they have their own refectory because they have their own uh, meal timetable so they 
that they mm, more they have more meals than we do. Mm. And the pilgrims refectory is open every day from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. with a little break in the afternoon. And everybody can eat there for free. So it's um, a bit different. So this rule, uh, and I wanted to highlight this, it's, it's, it's quite different from many, many other monasteries and perhaps places of pilgrimage where would you mm, see. Mm, well, uh, but that was a blessing of Father Zasima. He wanted to, um, to feed everybody who, uh, at any time. So, and the first thing he would insist, you know, when somebody comes to the monastery, they need to be directed to the refectory and to eat something, to eat some food, um, physical, and then to go and to pray in church, mm, not to be hungry. So that was, uh, and of course, after the liturgy, it's not before the, if, not before the liturgy, it's after the liturgy, but if just people come to visit the monastery, you know, so he would insist that they would go and eat something first. So that's why, and uh, that was his wish, his blessing to keep um, pilgrims um, at the factory open to all the day, all the day, um, until the late evening. Some days, um, at some, some more than 500 pilgrims sit in the monastery. Well, it was before the war, actually. Now it's, um, we have fewer pilgrims. But still, well, it's possible to come to the monastery. There's even some of uh, some, some 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 people from England managed to come recently. Mm -hmm. So please, could you show the next one? Mm -hmm. So the dimension of the Most Holy Mother of God is the patronal feast of the monastery. And the preparations are long and thorough. In the middle of the church, a tabernacle decorated with flowers is set up. You can see it. Um, you can see it. The deacons are, uh, stand just in front. Of, and uh, in which the burial shroud of the Mother of God is put. You see on the picture one of the most moving and beautiful services. As the 29th of August at night, when, all, when the all-night vigil with the rite of the burial is celebrated in the Holy Domitian Cathedral. Mm -hmm. The next picture. And after this service, the rite of Panagia, of the Panagia is depicted on the, on, on the uh, which is depicted on, the, on this picture, on this photo. It is performed after many hours long all night vigil with the rite of the burial of the shroud of the Mother of God. And this is a long awaited moment of the service when the Father Superior, Akhmanda Tambrosi, and the uh, other clergy raised the Panagia, a special bread made in honor of the Mother of God. At that moment, they glorify the Holy Trinity and ask for help from the Most Pure Virgin. So this is a um, uh, beautiful night vigil. Also many, many people come there to, to, to the monastery. Please, could you show the next slide? Mm -hmm. And then um, the uh, diaconia and the education. Oh, the sisters and the fathers they visit regularly um, orphanages and care homes, also prisons, um, where they try to support their inhabitants. Also, there is a Sunday school for the children in the monastery. So we do many different activities with, with the children, celebration feasts, the theater, sports competition, organized sports competitions for them, games, uh, walking tours with backpacks and tents. Um, yeah, so that's... Um, that also was a blessing uh, of the Father. Of course, everything we just, we try to fulfill his blessings and, his, uh, and to realize his ideas. And please, next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the monastery welcomes pilgrims, as I mentioned. And um, there is a pilgrims area that holds 200 people in the basement of the sisters building. 
um, some other buildings we have separate, some for, for, for priests and, and some others. Um, if necessary, uh, for some feasts, big feasts, um, we even just give mattresses and, 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 and just people can sleep in, in the cathedral or somewhere in church even. So it's possible to sleep there if there are too many people to accommodate in buildings. Um, but since the beginning of the military action in Eastern Ukraine in April 2014, a humanitarian crisis has broken out in the territories of Donetsk, Kugansk and the adjacent regions. And the monastery has become a center for distribution of humanitarian aid in the Donetsk region. And it has accommodated at that moment hundreds of refugees, providing them with food, shelter, clothes and medical aid. So the food and medical aid is being um, distributed in the region through the network of the church parishes, as well as directly given to some hospitals, social organizations, and individual seekers. Um, the monastery also continues its service for disabled and elderly people who live there permanently. So the brothers and sisters of the monastic community feed dozens of visitors every day for free. And the monastery needs um, to pay its monthly utility bills and maintain its buildings. It also needs to buy medicines and medical supplies for the House of Mercy. So we will be grateful for any donation you can make towards our social and humanitarian service. Please, can you switch to next slide? Yeah, spiritual and liturgical traditions of the monastery are handed down from the older generation of monks to the newcomers. And Father Vasima valued beautiful church singing. And this tradition, is, I believe, is preserved until today. On Sundays and great feasts, uh, and, and great feast days, the fathers and sisters' choirs sing antiphonally during the worship. So we have two choirs, um, yeah, especially for the vigil services, for the liturgies, Usually sisters sing because the fathers they serve in the in, in the sanctuary as, as priests and deacons. But for the vigils, many of them sing in the choir in the father's choir. Um, so twice a year on the first Sunday after the Nativity of Christ and on the fifth November, the divine liturgy of Apostle James, the brother of the Lord, is celebrated. Yeah, you know, so, so there are some other very beautiful um, traditions which uh, come from different parts of the actually Christian world and Father Sima introduced them in, in the monastery and the cross bearing procession, which sort of, I think originates from Jerusalem, from the, the, the church in Jerusalem. And also um, we have some, um, some other very um, special services. And sometimes, sometimes we even uh, we even sing in English. And you can switch to uh, the next slide, which is, I believe, the last one. <laughs> God bless all of you, and I'm ready to answer your questions.
Thank you so much, um, Father Tigon. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and I'm sure lots of people do have questions. Um, the way to do it is to post them, type them into the chat box. Um, but while you're thinking of a question um, to pose, I'd like to begin, if I may, Father. Um, I find it very interesting um, that it is a double monastery, that it's the two communities, the fathers mm -hmm. and the sisters together. We think of this as quite ordinary in this country because we're mm -hmm. used to it because of the yes. um, monastery of St. John the Baptist in Essex. But it's not very common throughout the Orthodox world. Um, and I wondered why that happened um, and whose mm. idea was it? Was it Father Sosima mm. or was it because mm. there were nuns there already? What, mm. what happened to, to make that mm. uh, come about? Yes. Um, yeah, well, that, that was Father Zosima's blessing eventually. At first, uh, you know, just, you know, all people were, gathered, uh, were gathering about him, was just coming and settling, uh, and that was just a parish. And in, of course, as the members of the parish, there was both, both brothers, fathers and sisters. And eventually when uh, it was, it became clear that um, the there was going to be a monastery or even two monasteries and both monks and nuns. At first, I think, and I know that, that at first Father Sima wanted to um, establish and to, to sort of to put, to, to move sisters from uh, that place and to, to, to mm, and to establish another mon to, to do their monastery in, in another place, somehow in distance, just even in Donetsk, I think, like seven, some kilometers, 70 kilometers from um, Nikolska, but then even to another end of this village, where is it, another church, like two kilometers. But then eventually, eventually he, he prayed, he, he, he prayed a lot, and, um, and he decided eventually that all both um, sisters and fathers would live together um, just next to each other and to build the buildings um, just next. Basically, it's sort of the, more or less the same territory, just different buildings. Um, yeah, um, and he just said that, well, anyway, you need to support each other and you can't do without each other. Uh, yeah, so that's that was his, and eventually he even gave us a blessing not to separate, not to divide the monasteries. Although there are two monasteries, and there are two official different monasteries, but he, his blessing was not to separate the monastery, to keep together, to live together, and to pray together, and to, to keep this unity of the two, basically the double monastery. So there's a bit of uh, <laughs> some confusion that could be, you know. Be, is whether it's a one monastery or two monasteries, and in Russian we speak really we sort of a bit confused whether it's one Saint Basil, Saint Nicholas. I think that the official name of the sisters' community is Saint Nicholas Monastery of the, for the sisters, Saint Basil for the brothers. But the Holy Dimension is for us all. That's why the topic, the the, the, the whole community is called Saint the Holy Dimension, Saint Basil, and Saint Nicholas, or Saint Nicholas and Saint Basil. It's always confusion. <laughs> Oh, well, that clears up another question I had, which was why you had three, um, three dedications, but that, that, is, mm -hmm. uh, that makes yes. it clear. Yeah. Um, we've had a question in, which mm -hmm. is, are there, any, are, are there many other monasteries in this region uh, around uh, Donetsk, or is, mm -hmm. are you alone, um, or mm -hmm. the monasteries together? Mm -hmm. Well, there is another, um, a very big monastery. It, it, it's even called the Lavra. It, it was given a status of Lavra, the, the, the fourth Lavra or the fifth Lavra, I think, in the Russian church. Um, uh, Svetogorska, the holy mountain, the, uh, it's a very beautiful place. It's a northern part. So our monastery is uh, situated uh, on the, um, in the southern part of Donetsk region. It's in, to, to, to the south from Donetsk, but to the north, it actually takes it takes four hours actually uh, four hours to get from our monastery to the Svetogorsk Lavra. Uh, it's like mm, I don't remember exactly the how many miles, but it's sort of like takes from three. Um, it used to take, but now these days I 
maybe a bit more. Yeah, it used to take like three or four hours from our uh, to, to get from our monastery to the Lavra. So Lavra, the Lavra is a is a man's monastery. Uh, but although they also had sisters and officially, you know, some sort of, uh, and actually some of them, when they became elderly, came to our monastery because we have the house for the care home for the elderly nuns. And so I know that there was a nun who actually used to cook for them, for the fathers in that monastery. And she was, uh, she, she died by now, uh, mother, um, uh, so she, she, used to live there for many years and then she came to our monastery and so and we have also two other uh, um, nunneries um, so no no any other double monasteries in, in this region uh, but there are two or three when in, uh, in the Donetsk diocese yeah of three probably or two no well I think two in Donetsk in itself uh, two monsters. One is destroyed. Happened. It's badly, badly affected because it happened to be just ne next to the um, airport where there was the most of the fighting um, happened, and so the monastery was completely destroyed. And the nuns moved to some of them moved to our monastery. Some of them stayed with the bishop, with metropolitan in, in Donetsk. So, but yeah, the, there are several monasteries actually in the region, but all of them are new. Well, apart from the Lavra. The Lavra was an old, and it's a very, it, it, their history goes back to centuries, actually. It's believed that the first monks settled there as, as roughly the same time as the Kiev Pechersk Lavra was established, because it's the same principles that were, they, they, uh, the caves, you know, they used the caves. And, uh, and it's believed that the, these uh, monks came from either Crimea or even from, the, from Greece, from somewhere there, where they also lived from the, from the you know, this, um, main sort of uh, Roman Empire, mainland, as it were, where you know the persecution in the eighth um, century, uh, when this you know iconoclast persecutions was. So that at that time, some monks started moving, you know, mm -hmm. further north, where uh, and settling, you know, and finding some place which res resembled them, their caves, back to their places. Um, yes. Yeah, so I that's find their new desert. Yeah, new desert. Yeah, and that, but uh, then before before the revolution, so that was a big um, monastery, the Svetogorsk Lavra, and it's beautiful. Uh, many many buildings and churches were preserved because this is a very good place for. And there's a river and very beautiful, um, the um, very picturesque. picturesque. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's um, and they used the Soviets. They used it for you know, like a resort, for like a resort. So and they preserved the buildings, and now they were returned to the church. And there are many many fathers. They have many fathers there, and so they're very active monastery. Um, yeah. So that's that's uh, another place for pilgrimage. So if you come to this part, and this post, of course, it's now also welcome as pilgrim, so it's opened and it's fine um, to visit. The both of our monasteries, our monastery and the Lavra, we are uh, situated in the uh, territory, which is uh, all in the, the Donetsk region, but uh, the territory is under the control of the Ukrainian government. So there is another part um, uh, which is, and some monasteries are located uh, inside the territory, which is uh, out of the control of the government. And we have very, very little communications, especially now, as you know, it's aggravated, <laughs> it's aggravated by the virus. Mm -hmm. uh, it's entirely closed, you know, there's all the um, checkpoints are closed now, so there's no communication at all between that part and that part of our, so it's very sad because there are many, many connections and many of our parishioners would uh, live in the Donetsk, which is a city for million, you know, population, million population in Donetsk itself. So that's... Yes. Well, talking of connections, we've had a, a great question in, uh, yeah. from Veronica, who asks, what was uh, the letter from St. Sophroni that um, Father Sosina mm. kept on the wall? Mm. Do, you, do you recall any of the, the content of that letter? Yes, um, well, the letter was written and just uh, actually it, it, it was written in 1992 and I believe it was addressed to Father, just slips out of my mind his name uh, in, I think he's still, or, 
uh, in the Pskov Pichevsky monastery in the spiritual father who asked about the schisms and different divisions in the Russian church at that time. And what to, uh, so that was about the divisions in the church. Um, yeah, and Father uh, Safron advised to keep the unity and to keep the patri uh, fidelity to the patriarchal church. And so that was his advice. And that was very uh, also topical in Ukraine at that moment when, you know, they started, you know, these whole movements of the uh, schismatic movements uh, um, by Metropolitan, uh, former Metropolitan Filaret. And so that all was very difficult, you know, to mm -hmm. figure out how to, and Father Sima also prayed a lot at that moment, what, what to do, because at that moment, um, you know, some people would push for the independence um, from us, you know, um, of the Ukrainian church. And Father Simo was praying what to do, and he found the answer in this letter um, to keep unity. And so that's why he considered this, and, and that was his also, his wish and his testament for all of us, of us to keep unity. The, um, Yes, and he considered all this um, um, that were, um, desire for autocephaly, Ukrainian civilization, politically motivated and very politically um, moved. So he didn't um, accept it at all. So that was his final blessing for the monastery. Mm. Um, not to go into the autocephaly, but keep the unity. So that's, and that was basically the main content of that. Uh, except from, from, from the letter of Father Sifroni. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've had a question from Jonutz, which um, mm. asked about the liturgy of St. James, um, which yes. you mentioned was, a, again, a, a blessing yeah. from Father Sosima. And um, the question is about whether that has the potential to kind of be an ecumenical um, service to people mm. who are from the Oriental Orthodox churches, or whether you mm. see it as... Um, more about going back to some of the historical mm. um, uh, liturgy mm -hmm. um, text of the church. Or what, what was the reason for, for mm. using the liturgy of St. James? Yeah, I can, say, I can explain actually. Father Vasima studied, uh, studied um, so he uh, finished um, um, theological seminary in St. Petersburg at that time, Leningrad. Um, so he studied there um, from the, uh, at the end of the 60s and in the beginning of the 70s. And that was a time when um, Metropolitan um, Nikodim, Nikodimus, or Nikodim, as we call him in Russian, Metropolitan Nikodim was in charge of the church in Leningrad there and he served and he lived in the academy and he actually taunted and um, ordained Father the Sim as a priest and taunted as a monk in the academy. Uh, church there, and Father Sima actually at that very mo time uh, also the future patriarch Kirill, he also was a student at that time, so he knew, they knew each other, and uh, yeah, and Metropolitan Nikodim uh, or Nikodimus was very open uh, ecumenically as well, you know, and he welcomed all sorts of, um, um, how to say, experiences, traditions from different parts of the Orthodox world. And I think it was at that time when they started celebrating the liturgy of St. James in the Academy Church, in the Academy Chapel uh, in St. Petersburg. So that's where Father Sima learned. So he basically, as a student, he took part and participated in the liturgy. So he knew, he saw it. And then uh, when he was in the parish, of course, this is a um, liturgy which is... Um, in this card, what we have, the right, it's sort of designed for the bishops, you know, for the many priests, I uh, suppose. It's not for one priest. Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of difficult, you know, if you want just in the parish. Well, you can read the prayers, but, you know, it's, um, there are certain um, things which, well, basically what the right is designed for the bishops, what we have at least, and what was used in the academy. So, and the Father Simon had um, this right, the, the, the service, uh, the order of the service, and he taught the fathers, our fathers, uh, how to celebrate it and, and showed everything and explained. And so we practiced and started doing this and, at, and yeah, and somehow learned and now we do it every year, it became our tradition. 
to the <laughs> quite well it's quite exceptional because not yeah. many churches were celebrate this service and um of course it's you know essentially it's it's the same liturgy i mean the prayer eucharist but when you read and use different prayers and some different movements as it were you know you you see the essence as it were better perhaps and in a new way experience this um you know eucharist and it's something very uplifting and very inspiring mm. experience yeah. Also, yeah thank you um i've had a question which is it could be quite a big question but perhaps i can narrow it down a little mm -hmm. it's um asking for advice on saying the jesus prayer and of course we could spend hours and hours talking about this and praying about this but I wonder whether perhaps we could narrow it down a little to what you were saying about the House of Mercy and about mm -hmm. the, the sisters um, and those there who they cannot do other jobs. And so mm -hmm. they just pray mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and the sleepless Psalter. And you mentioned specifically the Jesus mm -hmm. prayer. And I wondered um, whether there's something you could say more about those prayers and perhaps what they can teach us. Um, mm. uh, so their experience of, of the mm. Jesus prayer and the sleepless psalter and so on. Mm. I mentioned that Father Sima he didn't leave us like many mm, his teachings and writings, but we of course who who met him, who communicated who him, who remember his maybe his words and some instructions given either to us personally or to some others we, we had we hear it from you know others and there, there and there you know somebody remembers that or father told me that but um yeah as for as far as jesus prayer is concerned i think what as far as um you know well what we have so father Zima's heritage as it were you know his teaching we can um, it's in his sermons, and some of them are published in Russian. Some of them are still unpublished. Um, I'm, I'm afraid nothing was translated into English. Um, nothing has been translated so far. Um, and as far as Jesus' prayer, what I know personally, you know, it was very personal advice. And I wouldn't um, actually dare to, 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 you know, to share it for everybody. And to, and because I believe that you know it's, he 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 spoke a lot about prayer, and and that the prayer should be um, um, well um, shouldn't be uh, formal as it were you know it it should be um, you need to really um, not just to understand but it it should come. Um, from the depth of um, our, and to go to God and better, you know, and I just, well, I actually, I think I have, no, I'm, maybe I, I will read even, you know, because I have just a little, a bit of sermon I actually prepared. It actually, I think it was, it concerned, it, yeah, yeah. Please. There's, a, there's a bit, a very, very little uh, a bit from his sermon which uh, mentions Jesus prayer actually. <laughs> I just read this because that was a sermon for the church. Hmm. And he said, yes, a peaceful prayer, this calm, peaceful prayer of thanksgiving. Don't whine, don't wait for the, for the results. Don't wait for results. Uh, read uh, up there. What will happen next? Absolutely nothing will happen. Only what, read, pray calmly. And as I tell you all the time, there must be a calm march to go to the kingdom of heaven, not carried away by... And, um, uh, um, so today I'm reading the whole Psalter. Tomorrow I'm not reading anything. A calm procession, a calm path to the kingdom of heaven. Um, we shouldn't be as uh, some uh, stupid athletes to wait for results. I read the Jesus prayer a th thousand times. What will, come, what will happen next? Absolutely nothing will happen. There will be only emptiness. And if you breathe truly once to God, this sigh will go with, the, with this Jesus prayer to the very throne of God. Let every breath praise the Lord. 
pray, continue to pray. Don't expect results. Result, the result will be our death. Then there will be the result of our life. And then the answer will be uh, for the whole our life. That is why we cite each service at the end of the service. Give a Christian peaceful end, O Lord, and good answer, the last judgment um, seat of Christ. This is what the sight should constantly be in every human heart. Yeah, so. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I, hope, I hope that answers the question of the person who, who asked that. Um, I was interested about the fact that, you know, you're, you're seeing fewer pilgrims now because of the, the conflict. Mm -hmm. Um, and you've also been helping some of the um, refugees um, mm. due to the conflict. Um, I wondered whether you are still um, helping those refugees mm. or whether pilgrims are starting to come back. Well, you mentioned that yeah. you've had some English pilgrims yes. actually, but um, yes. th things change slowly, yes. slowly. Yes. But, yes. but what is happening now? Yeah, most of the pilgrims, you know, they, because the, the hardest year was the, the first year. Uh, 2014 and the beginning of the 2015 mm -hmm. and the very active you know this military fighting was going on so that was a very difficult time so many many like dozens of pilgrims came there and so they just left their houses and everything and some of them were destroyed but uh, very soon in several months most of them went back so they returned to their homes most of them just several of them actually left in the, and settled uh, well I know personally uh, a family whose house was just up completely destroyed mm -hmm. and so and somehow we managed a house uh, in the village um, near the monastery so we just um, um, so that house was somehow well you know there's some some people die and they just leave their houses for the monastery so and we um, allowed and uh, uh, basically this family to live uh, there and they still live there so they basically moved uh, the, and so there's some others perhaps, um, but most of them, absolute majority went back to their homes. So that's um, some, I know that some of them were not even baptized at that time. And some of them, and they lived several months in the monastery and then eventually they decided to be baptized. And yeah, so that's uh, all. It happened that I wasn't there in the monastery at that moment, and I was in Oxford at that, at that time. So I just, but I visited from time to time when it was, when it was possible. So, and now these days, yeah, more pilgrims are coming because before, you know, before this, uh, many pilgrims would come from Russia, from Rostov, the adjacent region of Rostov, the huge city again, the Russian city, and from the Crimea. Now, you know, people can't come from Crimea and, or I, I, well, it's very difficult either to, from Crimea or from Rostov, you know, to cross the, all the borders, so in, almost impossible. So most of the current pilgrims are just coming from Ukraine, again, from Donetsk, you know, every day, well, I mean, every Sunday, there would be like uh, hundreds of people would come from Donetsk, like, like, like from London, you know, people come to, to Essex, you know, many people, it's, it, imagine, you know, if you cut um, the monastery from London, you know, it would be a different picture in, in, the, in, in Essex. So that's what, what happened um, in our monastery. But, you know, many people come still from um, other places and towns and, and in, in Ukraine. Yeah, so that's still Good. have some faithful uh, yes. parishioners and pilgrims. Mm -hmm. um, now, we haven't got any more questions. I'll give people a, a brief a brief moment just to write any final mm -hmm. questions but in the meantime i will share the links that father yes mentioned. Please. So there are three links um the first one is um some information about father sosima in english the second is the gallery of um images um from the monastery um the language is in uh, russian i think but yes you can, russian you yes see the, you yeah. can see the pictures um and then there's a youtube channel um so you yeah. can go and see some video clips um, in your free time. So copy and paste those um, for, for use later. Um, there's no more questions come in. Um, so I think we will say thank you, Father, because it's very late where you are and we should oh. let you get some rest. Um, we are so grateful that you have um, uh, been able to speak to us this evening. Thank you.
Um, there's thank been a, a special thank you from some of your friends in Oxford and they hope that they can see you in the, fu in the near future when, when things open up and allow. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. But we um, pray for the monastery. Please pray for the fellowship and for the people who are taking part in these um, sessions um, and that it brings uh, a, a renewed faith and interest and love for these holy places. Um, and I hope I, for one, get the opportunity in the future to come and visit the monastery. It looks absolutely wonderful. A quick Thanks. reminder um, that we are going to make a donation to all of the, um, all of the monasteries that we feature in the um, uh, series. And I will post the link again. If you would like to make a donation yourself, you can do that at the link I have just sent um, uh, on the chat. And it's also on our page on um, our website, so you can get the link there as well if you don't have the opportunity to do it now. Um, and we'll be um, meeting again next Thursday, same time, seven o'clock London time. And that will be about Annunciation Monastery in Ormelia in Greece. So a women's monastery next time in Greece. And uh, again, thank you, Father Tikon. Um, and I wish all of you a very good night. God bless you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father. God bless you.